Okay. Yet. I can. Well, thank you. Yeah. Sorry. Um, our programs, they just, uh, it doesn't hold very long on, on the screen. So <laughs> anyway, uh, I'm so glad to, uh, to be with uh, this group virtually and I look forward to hopefully in May, we might be able to do something in person, but if not, we'll uh, continue to, uh, to meet virtually. That's what we've been doing and uh, over, well, really almost a year, we're coming up for a year and our uh, historic sites here in the city are currently uh, closed to the public, but uh, we've been working with our emergency uh, operations staff and they think if everything continues to go well with the vaccinations, with the numbers being down in the Fairfax Health District, uh, that we should be able to open in April. So we're all cheering because we feel like we're really not doing our job if we're not open open to the public. Uh, although certainly thank goodness for technology that we're able to uh, able to uh, share things like uh, tonight. So tonight I would like to share with the group uh, some stories about two women, uh, Kate and Kitty, a mother and daughter, and I call them women of substance. Uh, they're very different women. Uh, daughters sometimes don't follow the exact uh, uh, path laid out by mothers, but in their own way, they're both really uh, outstanding and remarkable women. And they're certainly very directly connected with our Fairfax uh, history. Uh, so let's get started. Susan, and this I, on the right. Before you get going, is there any way that you can put this in presentation mode so the slide looks bigger on the screen? Let's see. If you go all the way down to the bottom right in the red bar, there's like a teeny tiny icon that looks like a movie, old fashioned movie screen that you pull down. Okay, slide. Keep going, so. keep going, one more. Mm -hmm. There you go. Slide, okay. That'll do the trick. Aha, thank How's you. How's that? Okay. <laughs> all right. Okay, well, very good. Uh, so uh, the two women I'm going to introduce you to are uh, Kate Waller Barrett and then her daughter uh, Kitty Barrett Poser. So let's start with the mother, uh, Kate Waller Barrett. Uh, this is a young Kate Waller Barrett on the right and her husband, an Episcopal minister named Robert South Barrett. Uh, Kate Waller uh, was born uh, in Stafford County, uh, not too far from here uh, in 1857. Uh, she grew up at that time in a slaveholding uh, family. Uh, her father and brother uh, were both involved with the uh, Confederate, Confederate Army. And uh, in 1872, uh, a young minister, Robert South Barrett, uh, came to the Aquai Episcopal Church uh, where the family worshiped. And the two married just uh, just a year later. Uh, Robert South Barrett, I think we could say, was a very unusual man for his time. Uh, he believed that uh, women had an equal role in, in public life. And uh, he valued the opinions of women uh, just, as much, uh, just as much as men. Uh, so they have a real, really unusual partnership, I think, at that time. Uh, shortly after their marriage, uh, Reverend Barrett was posted uh, to a church in Richmond, uh, Virginia. And at that time, uh, both of them began using the ministry for a lot of community outreach. Uh, Reverend Barrett very much believed uh, in practicing what he preached, I guess you, we could say. And so uh, he believed in using uh, Christianity and the theology behind it as a way to help people uh, in the community. Uh, so both of the Barretts at that point in Richmond began assisting uh, particularly young women uh, who were not married, uh, but who had children and then also just uh, people who were very poor at that time in the post-Civil War period. Uh, so they did a lot of community outreach. Uh, in Richmond, they later moved to uh, 
Henderson, Kentucky with Dr. Barrett's uh, posting there with an Episcopal church and then later uh, to Atlanta. And all this time that they're serving the community, they also have a large family uh, themselves. Uh, this is a little later photograph, um, as you can see when several of the children are older teenagers and young adults, but they were also the parents of, of six, uh, six children. And uh, a little also maybe unusual for the time, uh, they have the dog, their family dog in, in the photograph. Uh, the woman that we're going to be talking about next uh, is this young woman, Kitty. She's the youngest of their, of their six, uh, six children. When they are in Atlanta, uh, Reverend Barrett is the pastor of a very large Episcopal church there. And Kate Waller Barrett uh, decides that to really uh, further her community outreach and work with women, she really needs a medical degree. Uh, she's dealing uh, and trying to help a number of women, uh, some who have been uh, prostitutes, others who have uh, who have are pregnant without uh, without being married, and so she really feels that medical knowledge will help her understand all the health uh, concerns of these young women, uh, the health risks, diseases such as, of course, venereal disease. And so she goes to what uh, was then the uh, Georgia College for Women and takes a three-year medical program. Uh, so when I say Dr. Barrett, she is indeed a medical uh, doctor having completed the program at that, uh, what was required at that point uh, in the 1880s. And, uh, but she's never someone to uh, set up an office and hang out her uh, shingle Instead, she uses that medical knowledge uh, with her community outreach work. And Dr. Barrett uh, saw the need uh, for what, uh, what could uh, be and what could be done to help the young women, to help their children. Uh, however, she really didn't have any money uh, being a minister's wife and her family had lost a lot of uh, property and income after the Civil War. Uh, but she also was able to come in contact through the Episcopal Church with the man you see on the bottom of your screen. His name is Charles Crittenden. He was a very wealthy New Yorker who had made a lot of money in the late 19th century in the pharmaceutical industry. He also, uh, lost one of his young daughters, Florence, to scarlet fever when Florence was four years old. And so after his child's death, he wanted to use his money uh, to, help, to help other people. And so through both uh, Dr. Barrett and Crittenden uh, being Episcopalians, they teamed up and founded what was eventually called the Florence Crittenden Foundation. And that was a foundation that established homes uh, for young women uh, where the women could come, be taken care of until they had their uh, children. So they were taught maternity care, uh, health care, uh, baby care, and probably most remarkably, they were taught skills uh, that they could provide for both themselves and, and the child after the child was born. Uh, in some of the Crittenden homes, and there were 79 across the United States, uh, Dr. Barrett and her staff also established what today we would call daycare. Uh, so the young, uh, young children, the babies and toddlers uh, would, would be taken care of in the home. And then the women, uh, the mothers could go out and find em employment. And so Dr. Barrett had a lot of really, uh, really what we would call today progressive ideas in both uh, maternity care and uh, baby care and providing economic uh, support for the, for the women and their families. Uh, this is a picture of Dr. Barrett at one of the homes in New York. 
uh, with the number of the young children that you see there. And of course, the question is always asked, did all the mothers want to keep their children? And the answer is no. Uh, some of the women uh, went to the Florence Crittenden homes, uh, had their children, and then, and then left. Uh, those children were later, uh, later uh, adopted. Dr. Barrett uh, tried to find other families uh, for, those, for those children, uh, but not all mothers, not, not all the single mothers did, did want to keep their children. But Dr. Barrett was very strong on the mother-child relationship. She thought the best place for a child was with its natural mother birth mother, if at all possible. And so that was the uh, Florence Crittenden Foundation that Dr. Barrett uh, was either the president or the uh, chairperson for throughout the rest of her, out the rest of her life. Uh, in Atlanta, Dr. Barrett's uh, husband, Reverend Barrett, died at only uh, early age of 45 of a heart condition. And after that, Dr. Uh, Barrett moved her family uh, back to Virginia, her native state, not to Stafford, uh, but to Alexandria and set up the uh, headquarters for the Florence Crittenden Foundation in Washington, DC. Excuse me, just a minute, I'll take a drink of water. And in Washington, Dr. Barrett started extending her outreach. Uh, one of the things that she did was to um, have work and lobbied successfully to have President Woodrow Wilson close the red light district in Washington, DC. But what she did before having uh, President Wilson close the district, as you can see, <coughs> she delayed the signature on the bill. And you might say, well, what, why did she want to delay it? Well, she wanted to delay it because uh, the government basically wanted to come in and just close the red light district. And she asked for the opportunity to find other homes with her Florence Crittenden mission and other housing for the, uh, for the women in the red light district. Uh, because as you can probably imagine, if they closed one district, uh, it would just move to another, another location. Uh, so she did that. She was able to convince a number of the women uh, to seek other employment, and she provided assistance uh, and economic support uh, for them through the Florence Crittenden uh, Foundation. And I know today we all uh, know the term of human trafficking. Uh, in the early 20th century, that was called white slavery. And this is another issue that Dr. Uh, Barrett took up. Uh, she was appointed by the United States Department of Labor uh, to go to particularly Southern Europe and some of the Mediterranean uh, countries uh, to look at, what, at the sources of what was called white slavery. Uh, young women being brought from, from those country, countries for immoral uh, purposes. So she uh, was really recognized uh, for her work uh, with, with that and uh, was really one of the first women that the United States government paid uh, to go on an overseas uh, research trip, such as uh, trying to uh, find out the foundations and the, the way the women were being enticed and, and transported. Uh, out, out, out of Europe uh, to the United States. And we're all uh, probably uh, remembering that uh, 2020 was the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment uh, granting uh, women the right to vote. 
Uh, this was another cause that Dr. Barrett took up was suffrage. Uh, she believed strongly that women uh, had an equal role uh, in both the public and the private spheres. Uh, this is a picture of Dr. Barrett with other members of what in Virginia was called the Equal Suffrage League. Uh, this is Dr. Barrett uh, seated, uh, and I'm not sure which way you're seeing this, but she's, uh, in my view, she's seated, uh, seated on the right. And not only was she a member and worked for suffrage in Virginia, she traveled with other suffrage leaders that you might be more familiar with, uh, Carrie Chapman Catt and Jane Addams. She spoke all over the Eastern uh, part of the United States uh, for, uh, for women's suffrage. And she was also uh, the uh, president of what was then called the National Council of Women. Uh, a women's uh, organization to work for not only suffrage, but a lot of other progressive uh, reforms, such as a change in uh, labor laws, uh, safety, for example, for women uh, in the growing number of industrial, uh, industrial jobs that were opening uh, up to women at that time. And she traveled uh, in, across the country uh, as in her position with the National Council of Women. And she also traveled internationally. Uh, I didn't look this up right before, but I think she traveled across the Atlantic 13 times, which was really rather unusual for anyone at that time, and particularly uh, for, uh, for a woman. Uh, this is a photograph. Uh, Dr. Barrett is not actually in the photograph, but it's a meeting at The Hague in 1915. Uh, Dr. Barrett was also a member and a founding member of what was called the Women's Peace Party. And this is a delegation from different, uh, different countries uh, actually trying to, uh, trying to seek peace. Uh, with the start of World War I, trying not to have a wider involvement than we know uh, happened in, in World War I. Uh, Dr. Barrett felt that women bore the brunt of any conflict while they were not on the battlefield fighting. It was women in that uh, time period who were left uh, without support at home uh, and a lot of times uh, women did not have economic opportunities. Then if they lost a husband or a son, the breadwinner uh, in the family, uh, they, were, uh, they were again left uh, in more dire economic uh, circumstances. Uh, so she really felt that uh, it, women, she thought could really uh, change the course of the war uh, unfortunately, as we know, that did not happen. The United States became involved in practically uh, every, uh, every country in Europe, countries uh, in Africa, particularly countries that were part of the, the Commonwealth of Nations at that, that time. But she and Jane Addams and other women uh, sought, to, uh, sought to have peace and at first sought believe the United States should not enter the war because of the consequences, uh, particularly for women and, and children. But once, um, once President Wilson uh, declared uh, war in April of 1917, as you'll see with the uh, newspaper report on the right, uh, Mrs. Kate Waller Barrett to explain women's relation to preparedness. Uh, she started setting up and organizing all kinds of service legs uh, to help the war effort. Uh, whereas in 1915, if you look for the, uh, the newspaper uh, clipping on the left, uh, she's saying that uh, women alone can bring, can bring peace. And of course, unfortunately by 1917, 
uh, that did not happen. The United States uh, joined uh, the, the war, uh, war in Europe. And at that point, she turned her patriotic side on and began doing everything she could to support the United States and particularly American soldiers. Uh, these are soldiers arriving at Camp Lee uh, in Virginia. Uh, that's, of course, now what's Fort Lee near uh, Petersburg. And what um, the Secretary of the Army uh, hired Dr. Barrett to do uh, because of her knowledge, particularly of working uh, with, uh, with young women who had become pregnant and some of them who also had venereal disease and other sexually transmitted diseases. Uh, the Secretary of the Army hired Dr. Barrett uh, to go to Fort Lee and to talk to the soldiers about the dangers of sexually transmitted uh, diseases. And this, this is one, uh, one place I would like to go back in time. Uh, here is Dr. Barrett at that time. Uh, she's about 60, 50, 55 years old, uh, talking to these young men who are in their late teens and, and early 20s but they realized that she was, was really the authority on, the, on that and uh, how, to, how to prevent, prevent those diseases. Dr. Barrett, uh, during World War I, uh, her foundation, the Florence Crittenden uh, Mission, had been given a large farm in Clifton, a uh, 350 acre uh, farm. And Dr. Barrett saw that as an extension of her Florence Crittenden mission, uh, where the young women could, uh, could come, uh, be housed, again, taught baby care, and uh, given uh, some economic skills. Of course, being on a farm would be a little different than being in an urban setting. Uh, so the women would be growing, uh, growing crops, uh, making homemade uh, jams and jellies, making quilts, all kinds of, of things that she had set, set up for them. Uh, but with the war effort, uh, she turned the farm into growing, uh, into growing food uh, for, the, for the army and delayed her, uh, delayed her plans uh, with the women there. Uh, Dr. Barrett spoke uh, widely and loudly uh, for better health care, rehabilitation for the soldiers coming back who were wounded, uh, who could no longer uh, be involved in the uh, jobs and professions that they had been before the war. And she spoke for uh, the better, better medical care and the rehabilitation uh, for those men, uh, as well as visiting uh, often the men who were, uh, who were at Walter Reed Medical Center. Uh, after the war ended, uh, she was part of a delegation of women that went to Zurich uh, to try to work for uh, different, uh, different parts of the Versailles Peace Treaty uh, that would uh, help and uh, particularly uh, be helpful uh, for the advance of women, uh, the advance in health care, and, uh, and the care and education of, of children uh, in the warring nations uh, in Europe. She also uh, reached out to uh, what to, we would call war brides, uh, women coming from, uh, from Europe who uh, were married uh, or engaged at that time to Ameri American uh, soldiers. Uh, she had uh, initiated several programs that could help the women uh, acclimate to American society. And she did this as part of her role as president of the American Legion Auxiliary. Uh, she was both the state president and later the national president of the American Legion Auxiliary. Uh, so she continued 
uh, continued that, uh, that work, uh, reaching out to the soldiers, uh, lobbying for better care, and then helping, uh, helping the young wives and children uh, of who were coming from, uh, coming from Europe. Uh, this is a program uh, from 1923 uh, in San Francisco when uh, Dr. Barrett was president of the American uh, Legion Auxiliary. Uh, photograph there, uh, the program for the, for the convention for that year. Uh, she was also very active after 1920 uh, in registering uh, women to vote uh, and part of what uh, we know now as the League of Women Voters. So her interest in women and the lives of women uh, continued uh, throughout, throughout her life in many different, uh, many different avenues. And this is another picture taken at that farm uh, near Clifton. And uh, this is when uh, she again was uh, working with women at that farm. And as you can see, the women have their back uh, to the camera. Uh, so she's not trying to exploit uh, their faces or their, uh, their conditions. And after the war, she did a lot of, uh, of treating uh, women with venereal disease and other uh, sexually transmitted diseases at the farm uh, at, uh, near Clifton. And Dr. Barrett, uh, you'll see, I don't know if anyone on is familiar. I'm sure you're familiar with William and Mary, but whether I have any William and Mary uh, alums, I don't know. But this is Barrett Hall at uh, William and Mary in uh, Williamsburg. Uh, Dr. Barrett was the second woman to serve on the Board of Visitors for the college. And this hall was being built at the time of Dr. Barrett's death. And after her death, uh, the new uh, residence hall was named Barrett Hall, uh, which the name still, uh, still is with the hall today. Dr. Barrett, as part of her uh, work at the farm near Clifton, found out about this house, uh, a rather dilapidated house from uh, this photograph. Uh, it's still standing today. It's on Main Street in the city of Fairfax. Uh, but in 1923, uh, there was an advertisement in both the Washington paper, the Washington Star, as well as the Fairfax Herald, uh, that the old brick house in Fairfax was going to be torn down and a bus garage was going to be built in its place. And Dr. Barrett saw that, uh, stepped in, uh, and was able to purchase the house for the Florence Crittenden uh, Foundation. Uh, what Dr. Barrett wanted to do uh, was to make this an in-town place for the women, uh, that they could come in from the farm. A number of them also, the women she uh, was involved with at the farm, uh, they had committed some sort of minor, uh, minor crime. Uh, so at that time, uh, they were sent to the farm and Clifton for re rehabilitation. And so they had court appearances, of course, at the courthouse uh, in Fairfax. Uh, so the women could come in. It was a place where they could stay, wait for their court appearance. And also, uh, she... Uh, thought that this house could be a sales outlet for the quilts, the produce, and other things that the women were making and producing on the, on the farm. Uh, and so she was able to step in and purchase, uh, purchase the property and keep it from being torn down and becoming a, a bus garage. Uh, Dr. Barrett did that for the first reason that I just mentioned as an outlet for the farm and the women in Clifton. She also purchased the house uh, because of what she thought was the history of the house at that time. 
And the history of the house was that this was not a house built in 1807 and 1812, but a house that had been built during the colonial period and was a place where George Washington had stayed, Thomas Jefferson had eaten, and other uh, people in our colonial uh, history and our early American history had been associated with. Uh, so uh, she wanted to save the house for both uh, the practical reasons and, and the historical uh, reasons. And as I said, she was successful in stepping in and purchasing the house. However, Dr. Barrett died uh, shortly after that uh, in February of 1924, uh, before she was able to put any of her plans that I mentioned uh, into place. And she died probably very appropriately uh, for her interest in history just after she had attended the George Washington Ball, uh, birthday ball uh, in Alexandria in February of 1924. Uh, this is her uh, grave at the Aquia Church. And uh, if you're ever traveling up and down uh, 95 to Richmond and you wanna make a stop, just get off at the Aquia exit and uh, you'll find the road lead you to this uh, 18th century Aquia Episcopal Church and the uh, adjacent uh, graveyard where Dr. Barrett is buried. Uh, she was also a member of several patriotic organizations, including the Colonial Dames, uh, including also the Daughters of the American uh, Revolution. And those are, the, oops, those are the two markers that you saw there on, on the grave site. So now let's turn, uh, there's so much more I'd have to say, I could say about Dr. Barrett, everyone, everything that she was involved in is almost a talk in itself, whether it's the Women's Peace Party, uh, whether it's suffrage, whether it's her efforts in World War I, uh, they're all, all very illuminating. So to, tonight I'm just giving you the overview uh, of her life to give you an idea of all the different things she was, she was involved in. Uh, so let's turn to her daughter, Kitty, uh, the second woman of substance. And I introduced you to Kitty earlier in the family photograph, if you remember uh, the young girl, the youngest of the children with her arm draped over her mother's shoulder. Uh, on the right side of the screen is a, a picture of young Kitty uh, at about age three. And uh, her mother has written on the back of that photograph uh, that Kitty is dressed as she pleased. In other words, uh, Kitty chose her dress and uh, I think it shows you again, she had a very strong personality uh, herself from, from, a very, from a very young age. Uh, Kitty being the youngest of her, of her mother's children had the chance to travel uh, with her mother as, as a young, as a young uh, woman to some of the different meetings, uh, the trips that uh, Dr. Barrett, uh, Barrett was taking. And uh, one of the cousins uh, had, of Dr. Barrett's uh, cousins had uh, married a Canadian. So Dr. Barrett took young Kitty and went to visit the husband uh, that cousin and her Canadian husband. And during that time, Kitty met, met her future husband, a uh, Canadian uh, from uh, uh, St. John's, uh, Newfoundland uh, in, uh, in Canada. And so Kitty and a young Canadian officer, Charles Henry Poser, uh, fell in love and were married uh, in, I'm sorry, I said, uh, Newfoundland, New Brunswick, St. John, New Brunswick uh, in 1916. 
And as you can see, he's already serving uh, with the Canadian Army. And of course, uh, Canada, uh, as part of the Commonwealth, is already involved with World War I. Uh, so this is a photograph of the three of them, uh, the newlyweds and Dr. Barrett, uh, shortly before then Captain Poser uh, ships out uh, to, to France. However, uh, Kitty uh, was not one to be uh, left behind. Uh, this is a single picture of her husband in his uniform. And on the left is now Kitty Barrett Poser. Uh, she joins what was called uh, the Canadian Ambulance Service Corps. And you can probably see it says Canada on her little uh, shoulder board up there. Uh, so Kitty herself uh, goes to, uh, not to France, but to England, uh, where she and other Canadian women drive Canadian ambulances, uh, bringing the wounded soldiers uh, from when they're landing on uh, British soil. Uh, they're driving them then to uh, field hospitals uh, all over uh all over England at that time. And this is Kitty uh, with her ambulance. Um, so of course she had to learn, learn to drive. Uh, it was required that the women even had to be able to change the tires. Uh, they had to be able to do basic uh, mechanical quick fixes uh, for the ambulances. Uh, so she's one of a number of Canadian uh, women uh, who serve with the Canadian uh, Ambulance Corps uh, in England. This is a, a sheet from actually uh, Canadian newspapers. Uh, you can see the some of the titles there, Canadian Women Who, dra who Drive the Wounded, uh, Canadian Ladies in the Ambulance Service Corps, uh, Kitty is, I'm sorry, I can't do a laser, <laughs> laser pointer on this, but in the one on the right, she is the, uh, the middle row, she's here, the far, the far right uh, photograph there. Uh, so these women got a lot of, uh, a lot of publicity and notoriety uh, for, their, for their service. And these are just a few of the documents that we have related to uh, Kitty's service. Uh, the first is, uh, as you can see from the war office, uh, it's her uh, driving uh, driver's license, basically, that she's uh, permitted, uh, permitted to drive. Uh, the one on the uh, bottom is from uh, the Canadian Discharge Depot, uh, the canteen, and uh, it's authorizing uh, Kitty uh, to have a pint of beer on Christmas Day in 1918. And you say, well, the war was over by then, yes, but uh, a lot of the forces, uh, of course, didn't leave immediately. Uh, they still had a lot of work to do with the, with the wounded and then just bring the logistics of bringing everybody, everybody home. Now, we don't know whether Kit Kitty actually indulged in having this pint of beer because she kept the, the ticket anyway. So uh, either she didn't, uh, didn't use this ticket or perhaps had a, had a second ticket or perhaps didn't drink beer at all. Those are some of the things we don't know. Uh, also in her handwriting is, um, a recipe for what's called a, a Canada war cake. Uh, and it was a, it's a very dense cake uh, that's made without, uh, without eggs because eggs were uh, scarce at that time. When Kitty and her husband uh, came back, they initially settled uh, in Vancouver uh, in Canada. Uh, a couple of clippings here. The news clipping on the right uh, shows both of them. Uh, the clipping on the left of just Kitty is actually from the Seattle, Washington newspaper. 
and uh, it's entitled, She Helped Her Husband Fight the Huns. And of course, the Huns was the term used for uh, the German, uh, German army at that time. For her service uh, during World War I, uh, she received the International Red Cross uh, 50th Anniversary Medal uh, in 1969. This is uh, images of both sides of, of that medal uh, that she was awarded in 1969 and is part of our historic collections today. And then we'll go back to uh, Dr. Barrett at uh, the American Legion Convention in 1923. And as part of her uh, speech at that convention, Dr. Barrett talked about her daughter Kitty and her uh, war effort. And she says that Kitty always had a mind of her own and was determined to go to Europe to be near her husband. Uh, who became a major, he was captain then, but then Major Charles Poser. And uh, she uh, had several sentences uh, saying how proud she was of how her daughter had served uh, during, during World War I and told a little bit about the romance of the two that I mentioned earlier, about Kitty and her mother going to Canada to visit a cousin and meeting uh, Captain Poser. And, and the romance uh, there. So Dr. Barrett was very, very proud of her daughter Kitty and the service, uh, her World War I service. After Dr. Barrett's death uh, in 1924, um, Kitty and her husband Charles decided to relocate uh, back to the United States. And what they did was to purchase the house that Dr. Barrett had saved here in Fairfax, to purchase it and make it their private home. Uh, so Kitty didn't follow in her mother's footsteps about making it part of the Florence Crittenden mission. But Kitty did use her home, open to her home all through her life uh, for meetings of different women's and youth groups. So the Girl Scouts could meet in Kitty's home. Uh, the new women's club met uh, in, Kid, in Kitty and Charles uh, Poser's home. And Kitty pursued also other interests. Uh, in the 1930s, uh, she opened the front rooms of the house as a tea room uh, where you could come in and have a cup of tea, a sandwich uh, uh, and dessert uh, there. Uh, the inset picture shows uh, Kitty and her husband, uh, Charles Poser, who then served uh, in, uh, in the Canadian Reserves for, for a number of years uh, after they moved to Fairfax. And when World War II came along, uh, both of the Posers again uh, contributed to the war effort. Of course, this time, uh, the United States war effort. Uh, so uh, Mr. Poser uh, then, or Major Poser is part of the civilian uh, defense, defense corps here uh, in, in Fairfax uh, in Virginia. And uh, Kitty is the Fairfax County chairman uh, for the Red Cross, for the war, what was called War Fund uh, chairman. And this is a certificate uh, awarded to her and also her Red Cross, uh, her Red Cross pin. Uh, she organized different, um, different service projects, including uh, making uh, socks for the men, uh, making blankets uh, that could be sent, uh, sent with the men uh, overseas, organizing food drives uh, here uh, in the local, local Fairfax area. But Kitty, uh, as a profession, uh, she was a, a garden writer. Uh, she was interested in, in gardens. 
Uh, you could almost say that she was an early version, an earlier version perhaps, of, of Rachel Carson. Uh, she strongly advised uh, all kinds of conservation uh, efforts. Uh, she collected rainwater. Uh, she used natural ingredients for, for growing things. Uh, she, uh, when the suburban explosion took place after World War II uh, here in the Northern Virginia area, she wrote numerous articles uh, advising the newcomers on how to grow things in the red Virginia, Virginia clay. So if any of us have a garden, uh, you can appreciate uh, somebody coming from different parts of the country and not being familiar with our, with our clay soil. Uh, these are just a sampling of the articles and publications uh, that she wrote, uh, the one on the left, uh, where it says season to enjoy mums is here. That's one of her articles from the Washington uh, Post. She was the gardening columnist for the Post from the late 1930s uh, through the mid 19, 1950s. Uh, she also wrote for national magazines such as Better Homes and Gardens. Uh, this is one, uh, the cover of one that has her article from 1927. And then the Post often used uh, her photograph and uh, something about her to advertise Virginia Garden Week, as you'll see uh, there. What to see during Virginia Garden, Garden Week, that's from 1936. So these are just a sampling of, the, of some of the publications uh, work. And uh, she also uh, was a flower judge. She judged uh, flower shows all over the Eastern, uh, Eastern states uh, from the 1930s through the early 1960s. And as you might imagine, she had her own private garden. Uh, this is from the 19, uh, 1950s. A portion of her garden has been saved as the Kitty Poser Garden uh, with some of the uh, plantings that you see here, uh, including the, the flocks, for example, uh, hosta, uh, boxwood. And uh, we have, um, one of her uh, garden garden plans from from the 1970s. So that's what we've taken our uh, our direction from uh, from the listings of planting such that she uh, that she had. And again, she was very involved with uh, with Garden Week. This is when she had her own home that we now call Ratcliffe House and Poser House as part of Virginia Garden Week in 1975. Uh, we would have had the home open for Virginia Garden Week in 2020 had it not been for COVID-19. <laughs> and so that tour, the Fairfax tour for Garden Week has been rescheduled uh, for 2022. So we'll look forward, uh, look forward to that. And she was very much involved with the community in addition from her uh, horticulture and gardening, uh, gardening work. Uh, Mrs. Poser was one of the first uh, board members for the Fairfax County Public Library System. So if any of us use uh, Fairfax County Public Libraries today, uh, we can thank Mrs. Poser along with a number of other other people for starting that library uh, system. Uh, one of her last uh, acts in the community uh, was in the early 1970s. It's Mrs. Poser standing uh, in the front with glasses of white, uh, white jacket on. Uh, she was part of the uh, committee that uh, that designed the what's today the uh, city seal uh, for uh, the city of Fairfax. So she was very active up until her death in uh, 1981. And part of her legacy, this, 
I'm sorry, just these are the tombstones for both uh, Kitty Barrett Poser and her husband, uh, Charles Poser. Uh, they're just adjacent to the large tombstone I saw or I showed earlier uh, for her mother, Kate Waller uh, Barrett. And this is probably her most visible legacy. It's a legacy for both women, Kate and Kitty. Uh, Dr. Kate Waller Barrett saved this house from being torn down in 1923. Her daughter lived in the house from 1927 until shortly before her death in 1981. And what Kitty Barrett Poser did to ensure the preservation of the house was to donate her property to the city of Fairfax so that it could be open as a public historic site as it is today. And it was Mrs. Poser's move to research the history of her home and have it listed on the National Register of Historic Places that really prompted the movement of historic preservation uh, in central Fairfax. Uh, so today this house has an individual listing on the National Register of Historic Places and is part of the downtown Old Town Fairfax National Register Historic District. Uh, it's our privilege and honor with the City of Fairfax Office of Historic Resources uh, to maintain and manage the house and open, keep, open the house for the public. Uh, unfortunately, of course, with COVID, it's a very small historic house and we haven't been able to have it open uh, for really almost a year now. But we certainly hope that when we are open and can once again uh, have the house open to the visitors as Mrs. Poser intended, uh, that we welcome you. We'd love to schedule a tour and invite you to see uh, this house and to learn more about the legacy of both Kate and Kitty, who are certainly two women of substance in our own community. So thank you uh, for inviting me to share the story of these women. And I like to close with this photo, this uh, two photographs of the women, uh, Kate on the left and Kitty the daughter on the right. I think you can tell without any doubt that they are mother and daughter. And one thing, although Kitty didn't follow in some of her mother's footsteps, both of them had a love of gardening and landscape beautification. Uh, so thank you very much for letting me share uh, some of their stories tonight. And if you have any questions, I will certainly try to answer them. And then please know that you have an invitation to uh, come and visit us uh, when we can safely reopen. That was wonderful. And thank you so much, everyone. I did. Um open up the microphones. If you have any questions, feel free to unmute yourself and make comments or questions as needed. I'm sure that most of you have seen the Ratcliffe Allison Poser house down near old or just past Old Town Hall coming from our houses um, <laughs> going up there. And it really is a fun spot when you guys did the Christmas uh, ice sculptures and stuff in there as well. It's yes. always been a fun point to tour and be part of. Um, any questions from anybody? I don't see anything in the chat. Tracy? I'm muting. Oh, there he is. Hi, Carol. Hi. So last names, is it just coincidental that your last name is the same as these, or are you or your husband related to them? Um, I, as far as I know, my husband is not related to the Barrett family at all, unless they hailed from the Wilkes-Barre area of Pennsylvania initially. And I would have to defer to Miss Gray for that. And not, not that I know of, uh, Dr. Barrett was uh, from, from Virginia. Uh, I can't say that some of his relatives may not have, you know, gone to Pennsylvania at some point, but I don't know of any direct relationship with that, uh, with that area. Thank you. 
but good question. I would. Um, the second question I had though is, did they actually verify whether or not the Thomas Jefferson and or George Washington actually stayed in the um, property? Good question, and I didn't answer that specifically, so I'm glad you asked that, uh, Tracy. And actually, neither one uh, could have been in the house. Well, Jefferson could have been, but we don't have any uh, any documentation that he was in, in Fairfax. But the house, the oldest part of the house dates from 1807. And since George Washington died in 1799, Unfortunately, he could not have visited there. Gotcha. Uh, he would have gone through what was then the crossroads, uh, just a crossroads before the courthouse was completed. Uh, they often, uh, the Washingtons would visit a family at a house on Pope's Head Road. You probably know that where that route is. And then also go into Washington, D.C. to see other other grandchildren. So they could have passed through the area, uh, but uh, Washington could not have stayed in the house because there was no house at that time. <laughs> Which is fair, that is fair. <laughs> but it was part of the history of the property uh, up until the 1990s uh, when a lot of research was done, uh, dating the wood and other, other parts of the house, looking at different, uh, documents uh, that were not available uh, in the 1920s uh, when Dr. Barrett purchased the house. Very interesting. We have a question from Ms. Peggy Fouts in the chat. Did Kitty have children? Uh, the posers did not have any, any children. And we don't know any <clears throat> specific reasons on, on that, uh, but they did not have any any children of their own, but she was very close. Uh, of course, she had a number of siblings uh, who did have children and she was very close to her nieces and, and nephews. Anyone else have a question? Oh, we have two people raising hands. Sharon, what's your question? Go ahead and, um, go ahead and ask it, you're off, you're off mute. I was just asking about the Transportation. She seemed to both of them seemed to travel. Did they have a private driver, or how did they get to California and Canada and all that? Okay. Uh, they would have taken the train uh, as as far as certainly the uh, those lines would go. But I know when she went to California, for example, for the uh, American Legion convention, she she went by train. And they would have gone, when they went to Canada, I know there's a report of them leaving New York by train. I don't know the train uh, you know, route that way, but uh, traveling by, by train. Uh, then uh, Kitty, I mean, when she, she would have driven herself, Dr. Barrett uh, never drove. So she would have had someone uh, drive her di different places or when she was, traveling with a group like the suffrage, uh, the, su the women uh, traveling for suffrage, uh, it seems that they traveled, traveled by train or, you know, then they were picked up uh, by another conveyance uh, automobile uh, to take them to the speaking, speaking locations. And then of course, when she traveled uh, the Atlantic, uh, you know, she was on a, on a ship and I don't know, I haven't seen anything about how um, the transportation when, when she was in Europe. But again, I assume with the European train system that they made use of, of trains. Excellent. And Paulette, you had a question? Yeah, I did. Um, I'm basically a guest. So I, I came in just a, a few minutes late and I was wondering what the speaker's affiliation is and um, do you have to be, you know, a resident of Fairfax City to do the kind of things that you do? And how did you specifically get interested in the Barretts? I've never, I live in Springfield. I've never heard of them, although I'm very interested in Fairfax history. Um, they're fascinating women. And so I'm, I'm so glad that you shared information about them, but how did you get interested in them? 
Well, thank you uh, for the for the question. And uh, certainly you don't have to live live in the city uh, to follow, uh, you know, city history or be interested uh, in uh, in the local history. Uh, I work for the city of Fairfax uh, as the director now of the city museum system. And so uh, I'm always looking for the personalities that are associated with our, our historic properties. And more broadly, I'm very interested in women's his history and particularly the history of women in the late late 19th century. So I think that's really how I, uh, I developed a great interest in, uh, in Dr. Barrett. And then uh, of course, with her daughter who uh, left the house to the city uh, as, as a public uh, historic site. But Dr. Barrett is absolutely an amazing, amazing uh, woman. Uh, I think I said earlier I could give a talk on any of her, her outreach uh, and any of her uh, efforts in the progressive uh, era, whether it was suffrage, whether it was, uh, you know, care for the soldiers, uh, whatever it was. She, I don't know when the woman actually slept. It's one of those, <laughs> one of those people who's always, always on, on the go. And one thing I'd like to say too, I just didn't mention, but uh, influenced by her travels to different places uh, in Europe, she had such an understanding, a broad understanding of, of cultures and promoted everybody, everybody getting along. She was not a narrow-minded uh, person at all. Uh, the, and she wrote a number of things um, about this philosophy in the letters that she penned to her. She always called them her children, although of course they were all adults at that, at that point. But at one time she was in the, um, in uh, near the border, I think she was in Montana, uh, but she's right on the border with Canada. And she's saying, in other words, it's just a it's just a border. The grass is the same. The children play the same game. You know what is this with borders that we're always so concerned with country borders and you know with keeping things within uh, within a country or or uh, a culture. She in World War One she spoke out very strongly. And if you remember World War I, there was a great anti-German uh, feeling in our country, people who had German names. And, uh, and she said, they're Americans. They came here for the same reason that we all, all did. She, I just think she was so broad-minded. Uh, and that's one thing I really, I really like about her. Thank you. You can probably tell I'm a fan. <laughs> Carol, I saw your hand was back up. Did you have a second question or was that from the original Barrett question? I'm putting her on the spot. <laughs> and while she's doing that. Oh. I didn't mean to have it up, sorry. That's okay. That was from I the just, original. I just wasn't sure. And then I have one last question. The farm in Clifton, approximately where would it be today? Okay. Um, it was called, um, I didn't mention the detail. It was called Ivacota. Oh. And uh, the, a very wealthy woman uh, donated the farm to the Florence Crittenden Foundation. And she wanted it called Ivacota because she had property in Iowa, Virginia, and the Dakotas. <laughs> so it was a combination of names. Uh, but the farm is no longer there. What's there if, uh, if you're outside of Clifton, on Clifton Road, there's a very, uh, well, it's not so new now, but back in the 90s, there's a housing development called Balmoral. Mm -hmm. And that's basically where the farm was. There is a historic marker there uh, that mentions uh, Ivacota and, uh, and the importance of, of that site before it became a suburban development. 
Very, very interesting. Well, thank you. Well, folks, that is it for our evening. I just wanted to share one more thing. A huge thank you for coming back out. We look forward to your next talk in May. This coming month in April, on April 5th, we are lucky to host Charlie Clark, who is a journalist with the Falls Church News and Press, former um, reporter with the Washington Post. And he is going to be going through the grim presence, the American Nazi party in Arlington in 1978 through 1983. So totally different topic, but mm -hmm. still just as interesting. <laughs> um, and I think it was utterly appropriate that we did get postponed a week, if I do say so myself, as it is International Women's Day. And although she was an international, um, she was quite a woman, Dr. Barrett was. So thank you to everybody. We look forward to seeing you next month on April 5th, same bat channel, same bat time. And uh, we'll be sending an email out with a link to this if you'd like to share it with anybody who's interested and definitely check out the Fairfax City Museum website. They have all kinds of virtual events that they are doing and it's just wonderful at how rich our community is with history, okay? Well, thank you for inviting me and it was a pleasure to be, uh, to be with you and uh, I look forward to uh, seeing everybody in May. Thank yeah. you and also I really appreciate maybe if Tracy didn't mention it that uh, postponing a week because as fate